talking to you about reproductive rights for men and fatherhood. We have guests here, we have 42 and we have Derek and we have other guests coming on <laughs> later on hopefully. The main thing is basically fathers are being marginalised in the last um, I don't know how many years, 50 or so years, probably thousands of years. Um, if a man decides to uh, have a child with a woman and they do not get married, he has no rights whatsoever in Ireland. Nothing. He has none. Um, only recently a man um, was himself and his girlfriend got together and they had a kid. Um, they, they split apart. Um, she was like, I got with somebody else. And then she, she died, unfortunately, from cancer. Um, and then what happened was the a judge in the case awarded the child to the new boyfriend instead of the natural father, something which I cannot will never understand. I can never imagine for one second a mother that this happening to a mother. So tonight we'll be we'll be discussing that sort of thing, and we'll be also be discussing things, um, for example, um, why it is that fathers have literally no reproductive rights whatsoever, and of course we we'll be discussing the issue of how important it is that children have fathers. Uh, I'm a father, a very happy woman. Um, Forty is a father as well, and so is Derek. And our producer in the background here, so we're hiding here, is also a father as well, Vin. Um, Paul, do you want to say anything here? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I'd just like to say uh, um, father's rights are very important. And, uh, yeah, you're referring to the recent Supreme Court uh, decision, right, a couple of months ago, wasn't it, that yes. uh, they decided that uh, the biological father uh, was not to uh, to uh, get custody of the child that he was separated from uh, uh, after, the, after his ex-wife uh, uh, divorced him. And the custody instead was going to be given to... Uh, the uh, uh, this wealthy uh, ex uh, boyfriend yeah. that uh, that uh, the 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 woman was uh, married to, I believe, or but anyway, she was hitched up with this boyfriend in, in, in America. Uh, and uh, I thought I think that uh, you know it's so wrong, you know that that uh, I, mean, I remember that case. I remember I remember reading about it. Uh, and uh, it, the judge acknowledged that he was a good father, and uh, and uh, and acknowledged that there was no reason not to give custody to to him. Uh, and uh, you know, it's just uh, it's just so shocking. Uh, also, the censorship about this. The fa- apparently, the original articles has have been taken down, uh, and. Uh, this, I, sorry, I believe the uh, Irish um, Times still has it on their website, but the oh, really? in, in, Indo has the, taken it down. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the Irish Times behind a paywall, of course. So this, uh, it's really, um, it's so you know the, the secret courts, the secret family courts we have, they they need to be reformed. There needs to be transparency. Uh, I mean, this this uh, this this man, uh, this uh, who, who who was awarded custody, he he was wealthy and he could afford a crackerjack, a team of lawyers, uh, to uh, you make his case. And uh, this the, the biological father just was representing himself. Uh, I understand, and yes. uh, you know it was, and uh, John Waters uh, basically publicized this uh, uh, this uh, you know this case and apparently got into hot water because he mentioned the name of the judge, as I understand. Yes. Uh, that's that's really you know it's just there's so much censorship, so much uh, uh, you know uh, it's it's just so you know it, we need. Father's rights are just uh, being, you know, the discussion of that is being suppressed, and I, I it's so, it's so, uh, it's so depressing. It certainly is. Um, I think the other um, thing, basically, is it's just, I mean, this would never happen to a woman. I can't imagine any circumstance where a mother would um, lose to the new wife. Or a new girlfriend of her um, of the the father, 
passing away. It just, it, it, it yeah. It, it just, it, it would, I, I cannot see any circumstance where a stepmother would actually get more rights than a, a natural mother. Yeah. Right. This is a, yeah, this American was a step, was the stepfather basically. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, I, I, was he married to the woman before the woman died? No, they, or? they, they, they were, um, his boyfriend and girlfriend. Right. And the woman died, was it an accident? Uh, I, I don't know. She had the, cancer. Was, she had cancer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, um, does any, did, did anyone read the Irish, Irish Times article? Uh, it's a behind a paywall, uh. I'm trying to find it now. Yeah. 42, do you have anything to say? Yes, uh, the, the problem with this is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25, Section 2, motherhood and childhood are entitled to special current assistance. All children, mother born in or out of wedlock, shall enjoy the same social protection. Now, if that word motherhood was exchanged with parenthood, there is no way that could have happened because his yeah. right would, his right as a father would have been equal to that of a mother and he would not have been, the, the child would have had to be given into his custody and care. The, this is the problem. It's yeah, okay. so, so endemic within our society that fathers' rights uh, just aren't looked into at all. Everyone just assumes that because we're men, we have all these rights and powers. But the thing is, it's it's fictional, and we need to begin to change this as a society. Yeah, Derek, do you, do you have anything to say? Derek. 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 I think that the other, other big issue is that, um, I mean, if you really think about it, um, the different parenting styles between men and women is a big issue as well. Um, I mean, I was, I was saying to Derek earlier on, basically, if you, it's, if you think on current terms of ice cream and peas, now what happens is with men, normally speaking, what happens is a man would say to his say son or daughter, if you eat all your peas, then you can have ice cream, and would not relent until they had eaten all the peas. Um, whereas women, I'm not saying all women, but some women, what they would do is they would actually have two or three more peas, and um, you can um, then you can have your ice cream. What, what that teaches children is the that um, the, to get away with things. Whereas um, fathers, I mean, I mean, I noticed myself with with my own kid. Basically, when I'm talking to, him, basically, I say this: if we eat all this here, you can have your ice cream or whatever. Um, it's just it, what it teaches the children it, it goal orientated, but it's a lot tougher for kids because they have to do certain things. If that makes any sense? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Paul. No, for you, 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 you go ahead, forty two. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. The it's it's a total difference in parenting style. Although while fathers tend to be more strict with what the whether or not the child eats its, eats its full meal or whether it makes its bed or whatever, the, they all fathers also tend to be a lot less. Is that me? Is that me feeling back? Is that me? Is it? Yes. Is that okay now? Yeah, yeah, you're on. Okay, okay, okay. So you go ahead. Dark, Dark, you're going to need to mute your mic whenever you're not talking, mate, because it's coming back as feedback. Okay. Uh, what the, the other thing that fathers tend to do is they tend to allow their children to be more adventurous. Uh, whenever a child's learning to ride a bike and eventually falls off, you know, it's it's always the fathers that are there sort of going, right, get back on and give it another go, and they'll let them walk a little bit further in front of them in the forest, not far enough away that they're not going to be in any danger, but give them that little bit of freedom to explore and express themselves. And we now live in a culture of helicopter parenting, where you'll see mothers running around within two two to three feet of children whenever they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old and it's really not healthy for them. They need to 
be able to move out and explore, and it's normally failures that they get this from. You know, so we, we need to have a really good think about what failures actually bring to parenting and make a conscious decision as a society to stop excluding them uh, th- after there's been some form of the separation. That case that you had down in Dublin where the child was given the the his ex partner's new boyfriend, it's just crazy. That there is no rhyme or reason or sense to that. Uh Paul. Yep. Sorry, I just my, my, my mic was muted. Yeah. Uh sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a uh, it is an injustice that case, and uh, it's just it's so sad that it's it's uh, there's a basically a media blackout uh, uh, going on, and uh, it's people are not discussing discussing Fowler's rights. Uh, well, we are discussing it here, and that's good, and you know, but it's where it's not being we're not breaking into the mainstream yet. But uh, it's important that we discuss these issues and uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, eventually uh, uh, we, we people will see sense. But I have nothing else to add, really. I just uh, – uh, what about in, in Northern Ireland 42? Is there similar miscarriages of justice going on in Northern Irish courts? It, there, it, it is quite uh, – it's very much the same. However, there have been, uh, and my evidence at the moment's anecdotal, but I am hearing of more men running in family courts. Now, not enough for to be putting out any bumping and going, we've got a big victory here. But these are, these are the pebbles that are coming through that shows that it is possible. And hopefully this will be able to kick on as a movement and from small successes be able to get more people through the gates. It is becoming possible to do, but it is a major struggle. And the the biggest problem is the lack of evidence required for a woman to exclude the father from the from the child that whenever after a relationship breaks down. That needs to yeah, be yeah. placed on a evidential basis where they have to right, bring proof. Right. You know, there's a double there's a double standard there because uh, men men I mean if a man wants to deprive a woman of custody of their children, then obviously he has to to bring evidence to prove that the woman was negligent or abusive to the child. But uh, but it doesn't apply the other way around. So mm-hmm. you know it's a double standard. But the courts, the the family courts should be about the best interest of the child, you know, and, you know, there should be about finding a solution that, uh, you know, allows the children to have the involvement of both parents, even after a separation uh, or a divorce, you know, Uh, that's, that's the ideal situation. But, um, but our courts are confrontational. They're, they're about, uh, you know, win lose. It's not about win win. And that's, that needs to be overhauled. Not just in Ireland, north or south, but all, all over the Western world, I think. Very much. The other thing, basically, the other problem with the family courts in Ireland is that they they use psychiatrists that have been trained in the in feminist ideology, and the the whole thing that um, what, what I keep on saying is that fathers are not necessary or needed, and fatherhood and motherhood is the exact same thing. It's just to um, Basically, it's just essentially parenting. Um, so basically, you can have two gay men or two lesbians parenting a child. That apparently is the same as a mother and a father parenting a child. That's the illusion that people are um, pushing through. It also applies um, in, let's say, in the family courts where the psychiatrists are um, essentially pushing this uh, feminist um, ideology crap through. Uh, and stating it as fact, um, it, basically, fathers being um, fatherhood is being pushed out of the um, picture, and it's um, it's bad for kids. Yes, but I'd like because to psychologically, he, the fact of the matter is, fathers and mothers are different. They bring different qualities to parenting. 
I mean, and but this is something feminists deny. They think that the father, woman, and man were all the same. It's a cultural construct. Gender is a cultural construct. We're all basically woman. You know, we should behave like woman. That's what feminists say that, that we all should behave like woman, and uh, and masculinity is the problem. Uh, and so they they're working through that. They conclude that you know. It's perfectly okay for, you know, two people who have feminine qualities to, to raise a child. And, uh, I think no, I think, I think you should have uh, one person with a, a feminine quality and another person with a masculine quality. And that's the best environment to raise a child in. Uh, you know, and uh, a, a woman brings certain empathy, a man brings structure. Uh, and together, uh, they provide uh, uh, the best environment for a child to be raised in. You know, I mean, it's it's intuitive, it's common sense, but feminists sort of fire down all of that. They think that you know, it's that's uh, that's like uh, old uh, old news, and uh, you know, you know, and uh, that's old fashioned. They say, and um, that's not. It's normal. It's 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 part of it's part of life. You know. Very much. I was talking to uh, Janet Bloomfield there um, during the um, I think it was last um, talk we had or t- talk we had before. Uh, one of the things that she was saying was that the um, it, it's been proved time and time again the best possible chance for a child is when a mother and father they get married, they have kids, and the children grow up with natural father and natural mother, and it's a family unit. That's the best possible start for a child yes. um, this business of having um, brothers and sisters um, of all sorts of different fathers is bad for kids I mean um, it's well, I'd like yeah. to bring the, I'd like to bring the conversation down to reproductive rights men essentially have none if a woman decides um, if a woman has a child and she decides uh, after two years that she wants to be a child to be adopted out she can do that. Um, so basically what it is that we, we would like to ask is why is that a man cannot go along and say, I don't want to be a father? Right. Um, I mean... There, it, yeah. there was an excellent article on, on, on Voice for Men uh, in April. It was published, sorry, it was published in, uh, in August in which they discuss, the, they discuss this, uh, this issue of reproductive rights for both men and women, and they, they basically the authors of the, Vo- the Voice for Men website uh, wrote a, a manifesto of the different rights that uh, the, that they, they are campaigning for for men, uh, and they they also one of their campaigning uh, uh, items was reproductive rights for men, and so obviously for women we know they have eighteen types of contraception. Uh, we know that they can have an abortion. We know that uh, if they give birth to the child, they can uh, they can give it up to for adoption. We know they could uh, they could even uh, hand it over to to anonymously to uh, to a hospital or, or uh, some other uh, institution, uh, uh, and they would take care of it. So women have all these rights, but men all men have is uh, a condom or or, or uh, they uh, you Keep know they. Dick. Keep it, Keep it in, in your, your pants, pants or withdraw and all this. Uh, so basically, the Voice for Men uh, team uh, suggested that if you're going to give women the right to, to an abortion, then men should also have the right to opt out of having a child. It's particularly uh, unmarried men. They should have the right to opt out. So if an unmarried woman is pregnant, then what they suggested was that the unmarried woman has to send a legal document to the unmarried man to notify him that he's the, that he is the father and then the, he will have an opportunity to agree or not to agree and if he doesn't agree then the woman can have an abortion within the limits so in the United States you can get an abortion up to 24 weeks so basically that's i think that's common sense so you basically uh, abortion rights for women, but it, or, that comes at the price of, uh, of, of the right for a man to, to renounce uh, parentage if he wishes. And of course, when the baby is born, uh, there should be mandatory, uh, paternity tests done on, on all, on all children, uh, as a safeguard as well. So that, you know, 
uh, you know, even if the father agrees to to pay half the child support if they're if if they split up later, uh, even if the father agrees, then this is subject to a paternity test at the birth of the baby, at the time of the birth of the baby, to confirm that the the child is his. And I think you know you know it seems to me very simple. What the simple steps we can take to to provide justice and to get rid of most of the steam and the tension that we have. But but again, it's the ideology of feminism. I think and uh, there's this uh, there's this disposability of men and this 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 idea that women are men are disposable workhorses. Women are. Uh, you know, uh, uh, dainty petals that we need to protect at all costs. We need to ditch this cultural meme and we need to uh, embrace the, the truly democratic concept that all of us, regardless of gender, are equal. Yes. Fairness and equality for all. Yes. Um, Jarek, you still there? Still here, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that earlier. I was on a laptop. Yeah, <laughs> these, 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 these things happen. Um, I think you, you, you were saying to me before about um, you're reading some documents about um, um, fatherhood, and you were not very impressed with them at all. Well, yeah. I mean, this is my this is my entry into this whole debate, um, which is which is. You know, which is very confusing, and I suppose in lots of ways it's, it's pretty depressing as well. But um, when I was studying um, psychology, my degree in psychology, I did all the family modules because I, I was I was always interested in in child development and stuff. And I couldn't believe the kind of things, the conclusions they were coming to about fathers um, from this research, and basically the 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 conclusion was that fathers are not really necessary. Um, they're not essential for a child's development. It seems to be, you know, it seems to be a rejection of like natural law or not, you know, the natural way that people probably taught for millennia that uh, a child needed its mother and father. And also, I suppose, you know, it's a rejection away from the idea of the extended family as well. So, in some ways, I wouldn't necessarily blame feminists for that, because I think it's I think it's um, a result of an individualistic, the individualistic culture um, that has arisen, you know, in the last couple of hundred years. Um, that's really enabled this idea to to. Um, to zoom in on the individual as the most important, um, as the as the um, the important element of society, and with that was a move away from the idea that you know that a mother and father, you know, bring different qualities to a child, uh, and you know, grandparents, I would say as well. Um, but what, you know, it's it's. What you're getting now really is, I think it's it's a form of social engineering. That case that you talked about earlier on, that John Waters wrote about, where the natural father was denied the right to parent his own child in favour of a non-biological father. I mean, that to me is just turning nature on its head. And it's it's yeah, just an indication of the, the broader broader moves in society that is just I just think it's turning away from nature the, very uh, very much the, the, the basis of what you're saying there about, about the last 100, 100 and a half years or whatever uh, this becoming the norm this mm-hmm. comes from a document called the Tenry Years Doctor which um, which was brought in to be in 1873 in the parliament and um, the Tenry Years Doctor act which was brought about by feminists, strangely enough, uh, it stated that children needed their mothers a lot more than they needed their fathers. And this went through Parliament and then spread through Europe and North America, whereby women were pretty much automatically given care of the child. Before that, the situation was the man would generally be given custody of the child because the man had the wages to pay for 
food, clothes, education, heating, all those things were of the man's, in the man's grasp to give. So after this 10 year doctrine came in, again, through feminism, it, they decided to give the child to the mother, but give all the bills to the father. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it, 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 there's none of this makes any sense. It's not sound, logical, reasonable. Uh, and the other thing is, we have now tied the the idea of custody to uh, child support, whatever whatever the term is in your particular country, because it works right across the world with some of different names. And the less the mother can get the father to see the child, the more money she receives from the father. So, you know, there's a vested interest there built into the system yeah. for mothers to keep fathers out. Mm. Well, what's the solution? I mean, uh, is it is it the right road to go down to start, you know, um, motivating men, mobilizing men to fight for those kind of rights to take a mother off a natural, or to take a child off a natural mother in kind of response to the, to the increasing cases of Children being taken off their natural fathers. I mean, surely that's no. that's a recipe for disaster. No, that that's not what we want. What we would like in the case of a separation is proper shared parenting, where the child spends three days one week with the mother, four days with the father. Next week it does four day four days with the mother, three days with the father, or something like that, or possibly week about or whatever works for that family unit. But that keeps the father and the mother both fully uh, involved in that child's life because they, as the natural parents, should be the two people best placed to make sure that all that child's needs are met. Yeah. Basically, the best interest of the child means the involvement of both parents. But the problem we have with the family courts is that it's, it's basically an adversarial system yeah. where it's winner takes all. And uh, they, the lawyers get paid a lot of money and uh, you know and basically the, the parents go at each other like Rottweilers uh, you know in this kind of fest uh, this blood fest of uh, you know this hate fest uh, in the family courts uh, you know it's just it's totally wrong the way we're going about it what we need is a joint parenting mandate this was introduced in the Canadian Parliament in the late 90s it was introduced, uh, I think George Galloway, the MP in Britain, introduced it in Westminster, and he's got a, quite a lot of support for it, about uh, at least 120 MPs. So we're not exactly, we, you know, we, we, we're in a minority at the moment, but, you know, we're not like, we're not completely in, a, a, we're not a small minority. We, we, there is a significant support for the idea of joint uh, parenting mandate which basically means that uh, if there's a separation or a divorce, then it is assumed that the parents will get equal access, uh, equal involvement with their children, uh, uh, with their children, and uh, unless that it's proven in a court of law, it's proven that one or the other parent was negligent or abusive to the child or children, and mm. then uh, then something will have to be done. But but the I, assumption, the I assumption a, is joint parenting. I, I, it's win-win, win-win, rather than win-lose, which we have at the moment. I do agree that that, I mean, that definitely sounds the most sensible solution at the moment. But you know, in reality, you know, you know, you do get acrimonious breakups. You do get heartache. You do get bitterness. You know, it, it is going to be difficult to implement that in a lot of cases. So, I mean, isn't the problem further upstream though? In so far as getting back to the idea of this individualistic society that puts so much pressures on couples that you do have so many breakups these days. I mean, fifty percent of all marriages in 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 the states end up in divorce, and the rate is even higher. I think it's two thirds of all second marriages break up. So isn't that really the source of the problem? This modern culture that we have that seems to torn people into very individualistic human beings who are only concerned about their own needs, who are maybe only trained to be concerned about their own needs and don't think of broader units, 
don't put broader units like the family or the extended family or the community. They don't. They're trained not to put those units ahead of themselves. Isn't that the problem? Isn't it further upstream? And so long as you get 50% of all marriages breaking up, and like I say, two-thirds of all second marriages breaking up, isn't it inevitable that a lot of parents are going to be messed up? They're going to be excluded from child from their own children's lives. Isn't, it, isn't that going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think the stats, the Eurostat statistics are 2008 for the Republic of Ireland. It's uh, 23% of children have been raised in single parent homes, which I guess is about 21% uh, of single mother homes. Uh, yes. I mean, like, as we, uh, we all know that the best, uh, the best situation for a child is with the involvement of both parents, uh, an intact family. Uh, this, the studies show that a child is much, is more likely to be subjected to abuse, uh, in a, in a situation other than, uh, a biological, uh, family. So, for example, if it was the biological mother and stepfather, the chances the child will be abused sexually or physically is like nine times. Uh, than it would be if it was biological mother and father, mm. uh, uh, and uh, if it's uh, you know uh, various, uh, if it was you know uh, basically the safest environment for a child is in a marriage, uh, is a, a man and woman married. Uh, that's the safest environment for a child, uh, and so you know the, the joint parenting mandate would would not, certainly it doesn't solve the problem. But it does uh, kind of mitigate the uh, the bad effects. I think what what, not, what we don't have at the moment, uh, what we have at the moment, basically with the family courts, the adversarial family courts, the secretive family courts, is it's just exacerbate, exasperating the uh, exa- uh, making the problem worse. Yeah. And uh, and I think that uh, you know a joint parenting mandate would mean that uh, it picks, takes pressure off both the, uh, both the parents. Uh, they know that the the default will be they'll both have access to their children, and uh, you know, and I, that's that seems to me to be in the best interest of the child. Mm. One of the things I'd love to do is to um, send a, a, a petition round to all the various uh, TDs in Ireland and ask them a question: Do you think fathers are necessary in a family? And I'll see what they say. Mm. Yeah. I tell you, well, I mean, you're right, John. I mean, you're right to, to, to highlight the, you know, the demonization of men in society. And I think, I think in, in, it's really, feminism is really toxic in Ireland in particular. And the reason, one of the big reasons for that is because, uh, the government in Ireland doesn't spend much money on defense. We only spend 0.6% of our GDP on defense. Whereas in the UK, it's about 2.5%. And in the United States, it's 4.5%. And that means that the government has more money to spend on feminist causes. And that's why we have such a vibrant feminist NGO sector in Ireland. You've got the, you know, they're all over the place. You've got women on air campaigning for, you know, uh, uh, equal uh, uh, voices for women and men on, on, on news and current affairs. You've got, uh, you know, uh, um, Ruhama campaigning against prostitution. Uh, you've got uh, uh, the, the various migrant organizations campaigning for migrant women, but not for migrant men. Uh, you know, it's there's there's so, such a poisonous uh, atmosphere that's brought about by a state-funded feminist NGO sector in Ireland, and uh, you know, uh, uh, it's uh, it's a real big problem. Uh, uh, men need to find their voice, and the men sheds are, are a good start. And uh, you know this discussion we're having every w- a week is a good start. And uh, you know, but uh, we're, we're up against a f- f- ferocious enemy, guys. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the problems is the enemy is actually ourselves as well, because we have to like first of all wake up and see there is a problem. I mean, most women know there's a problem, but most men don't seem to be. Uh, most men seem to be oblivious to what's going on around them. It's only until they, um, something really bad happens that they um, come along and they start uh, realizing how few rights we have um, compared to women, um, especially in reproductive rights. 
I mean, fatherhood is one of the big issues as well, which um, needs to be addressed. Um, the importance of fatherhood, why is fathers are needed, um, the difference um, the difference between between fathering a child and mothering a child. Um, yeah. I was talking to Derek earlier on about the issue of um, parenting. Parenting basically means father and mother because we have different ways of teaching children, uh, different ways of punishing them, different ways of loving them, different ways of showing how we feel. Um, yeah. This applies both to um, daughters and sons. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is this oh, is the thing. This is what feminism does. It basically, it basically denies the psychological differences between men and women. It denies that we have different brains. And you know, I think we, if psychology should be something that that should be taught in secondary school. You know, I think it's much more useful than teaching uh, religion. I think, or even you know, spirituality. I think you know, the developmental psychology. Uh, you know, the how ch- ch- children become adults, how their brains develop. I think that's a very uh, uh, useful subject uh, to teach our kids because you know, I mean, it's the the, 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 the science tells us at two months in utero, uh, a, a baby boy, uh, a, ba- a boy fetus uh, gets a testosterone flood, which basically rewires a boy's brain. Uh, so even at birth, it has been shown that a boy beha- behaves differently to a girl. It's been shown. Uh, the, Simon Baron Cohen did a study in the University of Cambridge, and he, and he basically showed a picture of a face uh, and a picture of a, a object to each uh, uh, one year old baby and he found that boys tend tended to look at the picture of the object and girls tended to look at, at the picture of the face and that just shows that even before toys are introduced to these children uh, even before cultural uh, uh, cues are introduced that already they're behaving like like boys and girls, you know, and this is at one day. I mean, this is a fact, and this fact feminists deny. And so they, and hence we have the, you know, the feminists say that fathers are not needed because fathers should behave like women, basically. Fam- fathers should be feminized, so, you know, fathers are not needed, you know. But, but, and masculinity has been, in our culture, has been, has been slandered for the uh, last 40 years, you know, in, in our culture, you know, when was the last, uh, can you think of a, uh, of a program where a, a father, uh, not a comedy or where fathers are celebrated in like uh, in a sitcom, for example, where you have a, a strong father figure. I mean, uh, you know, you have, you, you know, you have the, uh, the guy, Mr. Mark, what's Mr. Peter Griffin on, uh, that, that, uh, that ca- uh, cartoon, um, show and you have, uh, you know, Homer Simpson, you know, the, the men are portrayed as idiots and they're not, they're not portrayed as being heroes and as, as intelligent people. You know, it's, it's, it's shocking what's going on. It's very, very, very bad stereotypes. <clears throat> Prentice. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear, you can hear you just fine. Yeah, listen, we're, 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 talk, we're talking about male, male reproductive rights and we're talking about, um, fatherhood and how important it is to me. I, 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 I don't know, are you a father or not? I'm a stepfather. Right. Uh, have you, have you, I how did you get on with your own father? Oh, I get along, actually get along great with my father. Uh, we yeah, talk but... several times a week. Mm. And, uh, even though he's, uh, Christian and I'm atheist, um, we get along pretty well and we have some very animated conversations and, um, he listens to my anti-feminism and tolerates it and i listen to his uh bible thumping in exchange and we have a lot of good laughs about it <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it sounds it sounds great um so your apprentice you're saying your father is both bible thumper and a feminist is he no he's not he's not a feminist uh yeah. he's more so what you call a christian uh white knight Right. I was talking to a few of those guys there earlier on today on a for an Irish forum, and um, it just it, the, the whole notion that um, that um, women are as strong and able as men are just seems to be a, 
it's just alien to them. They keep on saying, we must protect women. I agree. I think we should protect men as well because I believe that women are just as strong as men are. I believe that too. And and being a war vet myself, I've actually seen it up uh, up close. I've seen what women are capable of and um, when the crap hits the fan, so to speak. And um, I've seen them, you know, uh, pushing their physical fitness limits. I've uh, seen them um, handling um, life-threatening situations. So I know that women are capable of, you know, just as pretty much as much as men are if they, you know, put their minds to it. And if society actually challenges women as much as they challenge men. And that's the thing. Um, we really have not seen a culture where society has ever challenged women the way they challenge men and held them responsible the way they hold men and boys responsible. And I think, um, really more than anything, that's what's holding women back. Them not holding themselves accountable and society not holding them uh, accountable as well. Um, I think I think I think what it amounts to basically is women choose different things to men. That's really what I mean. We all cannot be the same. So basically, what women choose, men don't choose. Um, it's just based on personal choices. Um, but moving on to, um, do, do you think fathers and mothers teach their kids different ways, Prentice? Yeah, I think there's a difference in the way um, fathers and mothers teach their children. Um, father, well, mothers are more nurturing. Well, I wouldn't say nurturing; they're more um, lenient with their children, and um, they're more. They reward their generally children. Speaking, I, I, should, I should point out, generally speaking. Generally speaking, they okay. reward their children unconditionally. And with fathers, is is typically different. Uh, with fathers, uh, what we tend to do is we we reward um, good behavior. We we reward uh, productive behavior, um, and we punish. Um, hurtful behavior, uh, abusive behavior from children, and unfair behavior. Um, And also, we tend to allow children the room to fail. We we tend to allow uh, children more room to fail than mothers. This was was discussed earlier on um, where we – I can't remember who said it. Basically, what it is that fathers tend to let their children get into more dangerous situations, for want of a better word, to challenge them. To challenge them. Because um, with our background, you know, the way we grew up, we knew that uh, we either adapt or we pretty much we pretty much end up dying or we end up on the streets as men. So we already know what it's going to take. For uh, especially boys uh, growing up in society, so you know when we're teaching that that boy how to ride a bike, uh, we're not going to sit up there and hold him on the bike twenty four seven the way a mother would do. Uh, I think uh... we're going to push him. We're going to prop him up until we see he's he's capable of balancing himself on that bike enough. To propel himself forward, a few a few bumps and scrapes are a good thing for um, everybody. Um, it helps with character building. Yeah, and you and, and you need both of those inputs. You need the mother's input. You need the father's input. Uh, but uh, it was it was it was actually my, my mother who showed me how to um, ride a bicycle. Oh, that's great! That's great. Yeah, she was a great lady, um, and still she's around, by the way. Um, so calls them sure. <laughs> but yeah, typically what happens is, um, what happens is the first time that mother sees that boy or girl f- fall off of her bike, she's ready to, you know, tell the girl or boy they don't have to ride the bike anymore if they don't want to. And that's sort of her first instinct. Now, when the father sees the boy or girl fall off of the bike, he's going to tell that boy or girl to get back up and keep trying until they get it. 
you yeah. see. So ride yep. the horse, on, ride the horse until uh, it um, until yeah. you master it. Exactly, and you know, fathers tend to be soft on their daughters. You know, um, they tend to be significantly softer on their daughters. That's one reason why you need mothers around too. You know, because and also mothers tend to be softer on a little bit softer on their boys. So, um, and you know, I've seen uh, fathers who will let their girls get away with anything. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think that actually was a story in my own case, my own house. Um, has anyone ever seen any good role models for fathers anywhere? And um, Frank, yeah, uh, sorry, Frank, forty, excuse me. Um, good role models for fathers. Yeah, I, sorry, I mean, um, in media, I, advertising, anything like that at all. I have seen I've seen them in real life. I have seen men who do following really well uh, on television and films and media. I can't remember one. <laughs> you know, it 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 doesn't go the the image that is likely portrayed of fathers is this bundling fool that gets the washing wrong and can't cook and all that type of thing. Just incompetence level. A, a really large level of incompetence. When we know this not to be the, the, yes, there are men like that. However, there are also women like that. And it, there needs to be a more balanced view in the media. But what I will, I want to pick up on a wee point there. Some, uh, Prentice said that mothers tend to be more nurturing. The, why that is true in a lot of the case, and the overwhelming majority of cases, whenever you actually look at the statistics for child killings, more mothers do that than fathers. And the the reason why the reason why we don't notice it, there was an incident happened uh, yesterday in uh, what in Sly train in Sly train station, uh, where a woman heard herself and her son under a train and she's in the press as being described as a caring mother who had a strong connection with her son and only did this after a long bout of depression. Now, every time, every time that we have a story like this, it's backed up with she was a caring mother who was just pushed beyond the edge and th- this is the narrative that's pushed. But if we were to actually start reporting things, Probably, with accuracy, like the woman murdered her child, she murdered herself at the same time. Uh, but whenever you look at the statistics, the overwhelming majority of child killings are done by mothers. And we are. That's true. That's definitely true. Um, and, and, and usually the argument is made that it's because mothers, uh, are in charge of children more often. And, you know, I, I tried to look into that more to see whether or not that was true. And really it's one of those areas where the universities and the, you know, the police forces and the uh, statistics bureaus, they don't want to look into it too much. There are more than that. So I, sorry, I, I actually have, I've um, been doing a bit of searching myself. Um, the NSPCC, which is um, a feminist website, by the way, um, if you if you look at their, their if you look at their website, it, it says that um, of in the situation where there's child abuse or a child killing, it's fifty two percent of fathers that do it, um, as compared to forty eight percent of mothers. Now, what they do is they go along and they they add up all the one night stands, all the boyfriends, stepfathers, partners, all that kind of stuff, and natural fathers. And that's how they got the figure of 52%. But in that, um, in the document there, it says that having a natural father involved with a child can help prevent child abuse. So fathers, having a father there will help pre- prevent child abuse. Those yeah, I, I don't know how they do the statistics uh, where you guys live, but here it's uh, broken down by mother only. Mm. They show the statistics for how many uh, w- uh, mothers only were the ones that uh, killed the children or abused the children. Yeah, I saw those statistics. Yeah, 
and then it's father the centers, only, huh? Yeah, the centers uh, centers for disease control, and uh, in 2012 they published uh, the statistics, and it shows that 250,000 instances of abuse by Mueller only, yes. and 125,000 instances of abuse by Fowler only. And it also uh, shows uh, that this is for children, child abuse. Uh, it also shows that Mullers, sorry, Fowlers, uh, sorry, Mullers commit twice as much uh, murder of their children as well. Uh, yeah. When you include Mullers and Muller and Uller and compare that with uh, Fowler and Fowler and Uller, then uh, the Muller and Muller and Uller commits twice as much murder of children, of their own children, than uh, Fowler and Fowler and Uller. So these are statistics from the U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control, 2012. So it's a fact, but obviously it's uh, the the women are com- uh, committing the, uh, more. The mothers are committing more of the the abuse and the murders of younger children, whereas uh, apparently over the age of eight eight years of age appears to be the cutoff point where. Fathers t- after the age of eight, when the child turns eight, fathers then tend to be the ones who are more abusive, generally speaking, and also tend to 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 kill their children more after the age of eight. But before the age of eight, it's it's the mothers who are on the majority. And the yeah. age of one, to the age of one, that's when you've got a lot of these infanticides and f- uh, fillicides are taking place. The first year of it's, a child's life. And see, that's why I, uh, that's why I corrected 40%. myself when I said. Mothers were more nurturing. <laughs> Let's see, I call my. I think. I think. What, 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 sorry. One of the important things here to point out is that um, child abuse is not um, every second mother. It's a rare occasion. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, basically, that that's what yeah. I mean. Basically, I, um, I, don't, I mean, I know, I know one man. Let's say, who's, uh, let's say uh, both parents are equally nurturing. Nurturing, you know. And then, I'm sorry, that? No, no, no. I think I think you're right, Prentice. About generally, you you're talking about the personality of, of a mother versus the personality of a father. Yeah, a mother tends to be more nurturing and more t- 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 tries to connect more, uh, and a father tends t- tends to be more systematic. And uh, and ironically, the father tends to be better at teaching empathy to the child. Exactly, that's a really good point. Go ahead. He sets down the boundaries and he enforces it. Whereas a mother may set down the boundaries, but she's she's often unable to enforce the boundaries. So the 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 the, fa- the child often tries to manipulate the mother because sometimes he she he or she can can uh, you know make the mother cave in. Whereas a father would be insisting that these boundaries must be met. You must eat all the chicken peas before you can you know, have the ice cream. Okay, <laughs> isn't so, that isn't that amazing that you know the father who's so uh, demonized in our culture that violent he, man, yes, <clears throat> that violent evil man is the one that uh, most often teaches empathy in his yeah. normal parenting role and his role inside of the household. I mean, that is incredible. That's it. Yeah. I mean, if, if, you, if you look at pictures of um, the the um, uh, Vietnam War, I saw some pictures there of um, of men in obvious pain and being hugged by other um, soldiers. I mean, that's the uh, guys who were killing and, and all sorts of terrible things, and come back here and doing terrible stuff over here as well. But I mean, men have feelings. We have hearts. You know, we're we're not robots. We're we're human. We just happen to have um, masculine qualities, and uh, we have different ways of thinking than uh, what women do. So, um, Derek, we, we, yeah. you mean very, very quiet there? Yeah, I'm just listening with interest. Yeah, um, uh, there I mean, was I, there I was another crazy. store uh, study that showed that the way that fathers tend to play with children, their method of play, uh, teaches emotional control because. Uh, the father, he, um, you know, he puts suspense and fear and, you know, excitement into his play. And he kind of pushes the boundaries of the child's emotional behavior. And then right after that, he teaches that he structures the child and forces the child to control the reaction to those emotions. And I, when I saw that study, I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is amazing. 
because what we're told is the complete opposite. You know, we're told that the fathers abuse children and uh, they're the ones responsible for the mental issues in children, you know. Um, so this, this is a really uh, interesting uh, research that's rarely quoted when it comes to, you know, the mother and father's uh, contributions uh, to the child's uh, mental makeup. Well, they don't want to be shown anything that puts fathers on a good leg. They just hide all that stuff. Uh, they were talking there about the NSPCC. Their figures are, if they've got figures for the United Kingdom, I can tell you categorically they are wrong. There's a group of people who have been writing to every district council in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, asking for the statistics on child deaths uh, by mother, father, mother and other, uh, father and other, and the statistics don't exist. Nobody is keeping a track on that, so the NSPCC cannot have figures. It's as simple as that. They've made it up, or they've took what they can find and cobbled it along with something else. The NSPCC also produced a document about uh, domestic abuse in teenagers, uh, you know, uh, adolescent boys and girls, and they did the study and they found that it was pretty much equal between boys and girls, but in the executive summary that just removed the boys, uh, I would have no trust whatsoever in anything that the NSPCC is putting out there. Neither would I. They're, um, they, they are um, run by feminists, so... Yeah. <laughs> As soon as, someone mentions, as soon as someone mentions that they're owned by feminists, like, I, I don't want to know. Um, is the, the Irish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, does it receive government funding, John? I would imagine so. I don't actually know 100%, one, one way or the other. Uh, but I would think they would. Yeah. It's just so shocking, the, all the funds that they get. I mean, the, the United Nations pa- passed all these conventions, like 1967, they passed a... Uh, the Declaration on the, uh, the Prevention of Discrimination Against Women, and then there was a convention on the on the uh, uh, 1979 on the Convention on the Prevention of Discrimination Against Women that was passed by the UN General Assembly, uh, and then in 1993 you had the uh, uh, you had another uh, declaration, uh, another convention that was passed. Uh, you know, right from the get go, the United Nations has been supporting. Uh, woman, uh, and as, as 42 points out, Article 25 mentions mullers and children. It doesn't mention fathers, you know. Right from the beginning, in the Declaration of Human Rights, the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights. And that's uh, the same, uh, that's the same United Nations. When you look at their reports, they will tell you there's not a single nation on the planet where the number of women in prison outnumber the number of men and where there's a fair Sentencing, uh, sentencing rate between the genders that that does not favor women. Uh, I've I've actually looked through the uh, UN website, the uh, EU website, and also the World Health Organization website, site, and I cannot find a single uh, mention there any of those websites about male victims of domestic abuse. We, wow. our, show ne- our show next week will be um, along the lines of um, we'll be uh, touching on suicide and also the connection to um, domestic abuse. Sorry, sorry, carrying on just so they, people know what we're all um, what we're going to be doing next week. Um, I think basically one of the things, but one of the problems I have with the EU, um, UN, and the World Health Organization is that they're for, for a start they're run by feminists. Um, and uh, total complete disregard for for men and for fatherhood. Um, I really have to have a look good look a good look at their website again, trying to find any instances about fatherhood. Um, I will do that right now. Derek, you you going to say a moment ago? No, I, I was just listening intently there. Um, very interesting points made. Um, I I was also disturbed when I was studying this subject in psychology I was also disturbed with how 
you know, the, the fact that the statistics does show that the majority of child abuse is committed by mother, how that was brushed past with that same sentence that Prentice mentioned there, it was just put down to the fact that mothers are with their children more. But, I mean, that's not the way psychology normally operates because when there is these confounding variables, they normally would control for them. So they would work out um, the proportion of the time that fathers are work with their kids compared to mothers, and they would separate the statistics along those lines. But that didn't happen. It was just it was just like a one liner, and dismissed. And you know, it does point to the bias within all social science, where if the statistics says something favorable about men, it's it's either not mentioned or dismissed. Where if the statistics or the research says, you know, points out faults in men, that's just blowing up out of all proportion. I have a prime example of what you're talking about. Um, there was a study I, I saw from uh, one university where it was talking about uh, which gender is the most, uh, most likely to uh, volunteer to help others. And uh, it said that you know, men are more likely to volunteer to help others and to risk their life to save other people, but uh, women are more likely to verbally help people. <laughs> so this the study actually concluded because they said women were more likely to verbally help people. The study concluded that men and women were equally likely to help people. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, I had a look at the um, uh, World Health Organization w- website to see check something out there. Um, basically, I, I um, the search term I use is fatherhood. So sorry, m- motherhood first of all, which um, brought up two thousand three hundred and sixty six results. Then I checked out fatherhood on the um, World ha- World Health Organization and it has seventy seven results. So that's what. Um, the World Health, Health Organization thinks about men and fatherhood. Yeah. Um, I, I'll do the same well, the U, again. The UN have, uh, they were they were just a few days ago, uh, Emma Watson, the, this English actress, was speaking at the UN, uh, I think it was General Assembly or in New York. And they were, they were launching this new hashtag, as I understand, called He for She. Which basically is about uh, men should be manning up and supporting <laughs> women. It's basically the opposite of the uh, woman against feminist ha- feminism hashtag, basically. And I'm just wondering: is there a relation? Is there is there is this actually a reaction by the United Nations against the woman against feminism uh, movement? Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, maybe maybe it's it's causing ripples. It's causing. Uh, certain people in positions of power uh, a lot of discomfort because the woman against feminism uh, uh, movement or hashtag uh, they, uh, that's that that would that would worry a lot of feminists i think you know a lot of state feminists would be worried that that women are rejecting feminism and calling it out on its falsehoods uh, and even 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 enrolling the un now apparently to uh, push back with this new he for she uh White Knight uh, movement that has uh, that, that was launched uh, by Emma Watson uh, about a week ago, uh, with the with the support of the UN Secretary General, unfortunately. But anyway, uh, did did you guys see that? Did you did you did you did you yeah, hear her speech? I saw that. I did see that, and I know it was at the beginning of her speech. I only listened to the first few minutes of it, but she talked about how feminism these days seems to be associated with ma- man hating. So it was interesting that that she acknowledged that. Now she did go on to to fall down, you know, some of these feminist traps about, you know, that the con- contradictions are just unbelievable. They're just so blatant, like because the dominant discourse is that men shouldn't man up. That you know, for men to man up is a is a terrible concept. It, it's all about him denying his emotions and trying to be competitive and all the rest of it, but. Well, yet they'll adopt that phrase if it's in association, in connection with making women's lives better. Then men can man up. Do you know what I mean? Well, I put it like this. 
I had to sign up for the selective service at, at 18 in order to be able to obtain a driver's license. So, you know, I'm all out of uh, man up energy. Yep. You know, <laughs> I have to I mean, uh, pass the buck. <laughs> I mean, that's selective service. And we don't have that in Ireland, but uh, that's it's so it's so selective. Blatant. It's so Selective. blatantly unfair. I mean, like, a, a woman um, comes of age when she's 18, she gets all the rights of citizenship, but a man, oh, he has to, he has to be put on this, uh, roll call, and he might be called up to join in uh, some military escapade that the government uh, sends him on that he has no ch- choice or control over. I mean, uh, it's just so sexist. Uh, women are not subjected to that. Men are. Uh, it's, it's totally unfair. Is that? Did you mean national service, Prentice? Is that what you meant there? No, it's called the selective service here in the United States. It replaces the draft. Is that a compulsory service to the military? Well, it's compulsory. It's, it's compulsory, but they just call it selective. You know, it's, you're supposed to smile when you hear the word selective. <laughs> you you know, selective. <laughs> one of the chosen few. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, and so women aren't, um, they don't have to take part in this selective service. No. But nope. they're not calling for equality in this matter. Well, I mean, um, there was some mention. I looked in the actual news archives and there was some actual mention, some lip service mm-hmm. by, um, you know, one or two feminists where they said, well, you know, now, now conveniently, when uh, people brought up the um, obligation of the draft and serving in the war, these feminists magically, well, you know, we don't believe in war. Um, so I would abolish the draft altogether. But, you know, if we did have to keep the draft, then, yes, I guess I suppose I would um, have to agree to women being drafted, too. <laughs> So that's pretty much – that was pretty much the only position I've seen them take on the issue uh, right there. Now, so I was having a, sorry, Prentice. I was having a look through there um, on various different websites. Uh, I had a look through the um, United Nations website um, regarding fatherhood and motherhood. Um, with motherhood, it was um, – I found 2,320 mentions of motherhood. And 242 of fatherhood. Then I looked at the EU website, um, and in the case of fatherhood, it's 17,900, but with motherhood, it's 78,800. Wow. So basically, there's more interest in, there's more mentions of motherhood in the EU website, the United Nations website, and the World Health Organization website than there is of fathers. Fathers, they don't, they don't consider as fathers that important. The, uh... The reason for that is uh, all these gender studies courses because they are pumping out thousands upon thousands of educated women whose only source of a job is in things like the United Nations and uh, all these policy making bodies that work basically working for government and they provide jobs for them. So Whenever you put those type of people into those type of jobs, you're going to get a female-based uh, policy coming out of it. It, it, it's, it stands to reason. There's no other way around that. And until we begin to stop allowing colleges to indoctrinate uh, young girls whenever they go through gender studies courses uh, that are run by rampant feminists and have come out with the staggering so, numbers former yeah. at, at, at the mouth, at the mouth uh, poisonous uh, man-hating sexist feminists is that, is that what you mean for, uh, for the... yeah that's it you know <laughs> <laughs> another phrase you should uh, search for is women's health versus men's health uh, they're not right now I'll go up to the uh, EU website I think uh, well, see, one one of the problems as soon as you put a thing like uh, face health into it, what happens is um, it all comes up. But um, wait, well, put it in uh, parentheses. I'm sorry, like, what's that one? Put both of the phrases in parentheses. Put men's health like that, 
and then women's health. And that should narrow down the search terms. Yeah, with the um, EU website, it's uh, 3890 results. Um, and put um, women's health. So uh, 13,800, 13, so there's um, at least four to one. So, so we got 3,890 for men's health, and how many for women's health? Uh, sorry, again. Uh, 13,800. 13, wow. <laughs> so it's four to one. Uh, so but there I mean, you go. Even, and now, now you hear the feminists say that uh, the, the Western world doesn't care about women's health. Yeah. You know. no. Actually, Brian. And the same. Basically, I, I checked them all those websites out, and I cannot find a single mention anywhere on those websites from. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> from male victims of domestic abuse, it's um, it's like they don't exist. I mean, you have three of the biggest websites in the world. They're supposed to deal with millions upon millions, hundreds of millions of people, and there's no mention of the most obvious thing in the world. Well, it's abuse. funny you mentioned that because I was just looking at a uh, video from YouTube. I don't know if you guys saw that video I posted today, but um, it's a video where a social experiment was done. And this type of social experiment has been duplicated several times by different people. And basically uh, what happened was uh, in one scenario, this was uh, they had one actor and one um, actress and they were pretending to be a couple, and they were, you know, walking around in public. And uh, in one scenario, they would have the uh, male actor pretend he was physically abusing the female actress in public. And so they would work out the scenario where he would physically abuse her in public. You know, there were plenty of people around, pr plenty of uh, bystanders. And within minutes, within seconds... Uh, there would be somebody running up and stopping the guy from physically abusing the woman. So, you know, they switched the scenarios. They switched the, the gender roles in the couple. So in the next scenario, they would have the um, female actress abusing the male actor in public. You know, same situation, plenty of bystanders. Uh, this is on a, on a busy street. And in every every section, every section where they acted this out, uh, not a single person stepped in to help the male victim. And actually, um, what happened was the people's first response was to pull out their cell phones and start filming her beating the guy up. And uh, after that, uh, one of the guys actually jumped in to help her beat the guy up. <laughs> And you can, you can see that in the video, you know. And it was just amazing because, you know, we've seen these scenarios acted out quite a bit. And like I say, several different, um, uh, you know, universities have done it. Different television shows have done it. But this was my first time actually seeing the male bystanders actually jump in and help her beat the guy up, you know. And they're laughing and, you know, it's it's a joke. What's so, really interesting is if you see a video of two women fighting and you'll see men starting to run over and then back off because, oh, I can't break this up. I can't touch either of them because they're both females. And that's very revealing that, you know, they'll let two women keep going at it because they're afraid to go in and actually stop the two of them hurting each other. Yeah. I mean, that's something that um, I would like to see done, like, you know, straight through where they change, like, you know, maybe two two women fighting each other, then, you know, uh, uh, a man hitting a woman, and then maybe the woman hitting the man, and, you know, maybe uh, have it be an interracial couple or, you know, change the attractiveness level of the victim and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, it was just interesting to see this. You know, once again, we see this same scenario played out where it's a joke when the guy is being abused. And, and all of this is, you know, being presented to us in light of the, this, uh, Ray Rice NFL scandal where now it's, you know, 
uh, were being called not only a rape culture, but now a domestic abuse culture against yeah. women. I I was I, I watched that video and I saw clearly she hit him three times. Yeah, you saw it, huh? And, After and, we- then, and then he de- he defended himself. He only hit her once. If he'd really been an abuser, he'd have kept on hitting her. He didn't. And just like you I mean, say, I mean, it's undeniable her body language and his body language in that video. She was the aggressor, you know, up until the point where they got in the elevator and he had had enough, you know. I mean, the- and it, was he a punished apprentice? Was uh, Ray Rice punished by the NFL? Uh, yes. The yes, and he he uh, they banned him from the league forever. No, forever, for- forever. Ever. Yeah. My God, that is disproportionate. Uh, well, I mean, uh, he shouldn't have been punished in the first place. I think because because even even his girlfriend said that uh, it was no big she, deal. Right? She she did did um, apologize to him. By the way. Just so we we all know, he he did not apologize to her because um, well he felt that he'd done nothing wrong. Um, I'd be inclined to agree with him. Um, he's done nothing right and wrong. I mean, basically, the, the way you have to remember at all time, basically, if you reverse the genders and you see a man annoying a woman and it keeps annoying her and keeps annoying her and she decks him on the ground, who are you gonna have sympathy for, the man or the woman? Seriously, I mean, yeah. I. Um, all you have to do with any, say, any of these things is just reverse the genders and then what happens, what you have then is you find out exactly who is right and who is wrong. I mean, if if I walk into a bar and I go up to a guy twice my size and I punch him in the mouth and he levels me, whose fault is it? Mine or his? And not just that, this is a guy with a reputation. So everybody knows who this guy is in public. So you're going to publicly humiliate this guy by punching him in the face in front of, you know, right in public so everybody can see it, you know. And, I mean, you could catch anybody on the wrong day doing something like that. You know, I mean, that's one thing you don't do. You do not humiliate a man in public like that. You know, I mean, that hurts. That, That hurts more than, you know, physically you know, actually injuring some, a man, you know, where you just take his pride and just flush it down the toilet for everybody to see. One of the things my, my father taught me was I've never hit a woman. Um, uh, I think that, that no, he, he never taught my, my, my sister is not to hit a man. That's one of the things that has always annoyed me. Basically, um, I mean, I've suffered abuse. I've suffered abuse over 20 years ago from um, a woman, um, a girlfriend, who thankfully me and her have split up long since. But I know that she is in a um, another relationship now, where she's married now with children. And she'd be doing the same thing to that husband of hers that she was doing to me. Um, it never actually stops. I mean, basically, but, but I've looked at her... Um, Two different eyes there recently when um, I, re- I realized that she was all she is doing is she is doing what she was taught by her mother and her mother was doing what, what she was taught by her own mother so these these things come through the generations uh, it's one of the things I was talking to Aaron Pesley about last week um, uh, before the actual show was up on the phone she said basically the domestic abuse comes through generations so when you go along and teach a boy if a father teach a, teaches a boy not to hit women, and that boy meets a woman who has come through this cycle of abuse from um, her previous generation, it doesn't do him very much good. I think based teaching boys to respect themselves, and a, ma- a man, when he, when he um, is teaching his son, respect your, yourself, son, respect your son first and foremost. Um, yeah, I mean, that's great advice because... And it's practical, it's it's safe advice because looking at the statistics today, um, women are being put in prison and, and convicted of uh, violent crimes at a higher rate, um, at a steadily increasing higher rate, uh, pretty much year after year after year. And so either the, the women are getting more violent or they're being arrested more. For being uh, violent, I think I think, I think there, there there has been notice more. Yeah, 
So, I mean, you know, regardless, it's, it's still practical, safe advice to raise men with enough self-esteem to know that, yes, you do have a right to defend yourself. You, you, you are important enough to defend. Um, and you're a worthy boy. Um, I was, I was watching, um, what's some caller, um, Whoopi Goldberg, and she said that if a man, if a woman hits a man, a man has a right to hit her back. And why not shouldn't he? Exactly. And see, uh, now, right before, uh, Whoopi Goldberg said that, a man named Stephen A. Smith said the same thing. This was a commentator, uh, for ESPN, which was, mm. uh, the big sports agency here in the United States. And, uh, he said the exact same thing that Whippy Goldberg said, but he got suspended for no, saying. Let's see. So, you know, I'm glad Whippy did say it and that, you know, people needed to hear it. But, you know, once again, there's that double standard again. I think what one of the most well, important things between... is a woman, you see. Well, a woman can say things that man can't say in, uh, you know, in, in public, it seems to me. It's yeah, you know, this is a, this is a black woman too, you know, and Stephen A. Smith was a black man. So, yeah. you know, they can't use the race card, you know, like the feminists love to do. They can't use that's, the race. <laughs> that, that's why feminists are so worried about the woman against feminism movement, you know. They're, they're, that's because these are women, you know. These are, these are supposed, they're supposed to be victims of the oppressive patriarchy. And here they are speaking against feminism. So, you know, and that's yeah. why the, U, the UN have now launched this men for women campaign. I think this is one of the reasons is because pushback against this. Well, that's this uh, crime, one of the things. Crime up movement. That's one of the things that encourages me, um, you know, along, along with, you know, the stuff we're doing here, seeing, uh, you know, you guys in Ireland doing what you're doing. Just, uh, the messages we get from some of the women. You know, um, telling us how what we're posting, you know, on the exposing feminism page is, is waking them up, you know. Yeah. And I mean, we get some compelling messages, you know, they're like, you know, I used to be a former feminist, you know, and uh, I can't believe I, I couldn't see this stuff, you know, until uh, a friend mentioned your page or, you know, until I saw this. Yeah. And that that's when everything fell into place for me. And. And they're angry. They're like, I'm angry that this information was hidden from me, you know. And that's what you're seeing with uh, movements like Women Against Feminism, you know. And uh, I'm I'm happy to see it because I'm sure you got some of you guys have been uh, at this for years, just like I have. And uh, we were ridiculed, we were laughed at. Uh, Not to mention the fact you're a a misogynist who uh, hates women or hates your mother or some of that crap like that. <laughs> I, we got, I, got, I, I, I got a lot of that today. Um, I'd, I'd like to point out something here for people so we understand, basically. Um, if you're striking somebody in self-defense, it's where you have no choice on the issue. Um, it's, 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 it's important that people understand, basically. Like, if you look at somebody and give them a dig in the head um, for no reason whatsoever, that is not self-defense. Um, the it's important that uh, people understand if somebody's hitting you and you have no option to get away from it and you have to hit them then hitting them so you don't um, cause so much damage you shot them or just stop them yeah okay well that's yeah. what Ray Rice did you know he was defending himself basically yeah I I, 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 I mean it, it wasn't like it was a huge big thump I mean I, I, um, I mean I, I know he's a strong lad and all that but um but I mean, she shouldn't know herself. I mean, what's he supposed to do? Well, you can actually see in the police report. It says unequivocally, unequivocally right there, you know, in, in clear detail that she was not injured uh, by him hitting her. So, I mean, you're talking a big, you're talking about a big guy. You know, he could have easily hurt her if he wanted to. Yeah, really hurt. Vane, do you want to come on and say hello to us? Hi guys, how you doing? You uh, want to tell the story of what happened to um, your, your kid in school today? Something very strange happened today, yeah. Um, there was this 
form, you know, like these forms they send home from school, would you like to permit your child to do X, Y, Z? And this one was to do with uh, some woman was running some uh, body image program. And I was looking down through the list of questions and I thought, you know, I don't think I want to include my child in that. And uh, I had an idea that it would cause uh, quite a bit of friction. So today my child came home and they said, well, they went into school and uh, they were called out of the class, given a book and told to, you know, go down to the library and have a read or whatever. And when they came back to the class, they said all of the class were upset, but at least half of them were actually crying. Because whatever talk this woman had done and whatever questions she'd given them, um, now we're talking um, 11 year old children here. Uh, they were all crying and upset about their body image after this talk. These these are young children that, as far as I'm concerned, should be, you know, not really aware of their body image yet. You know, usually that kicks in 13, 14, and they were all very upset. Now, I intend on going and finding out exactly what was what tomorrow. I, I'm going to go up to the school and find out what the hell this was all about. But... um I mean, because parents have signed, again, because parents have signed the form agreeing to it, I don't think, you know, they're going to have a difficult time. But uh, I'm, I'm going to insist that the principal no longer sends anything home to me unless it's directly uh, in relation to my child and that school and something to do with the school. No outside agencies or anything. I'm not going to permit any of that anymore. And I'm going to spread that to the rest of the parents. But it's it, absolutely ludicrous. Every child nearly in the class uh, was upset and half of them were actually crying. It sounds like. What, I mean, do you know anything about the actual um, course itself or it's the, the kind some, of questions some, they ask some, or anything like that? I'm, I'm going to try and find out exactly tomorrow because, uh, as I said, I had the form and I signed, I put down no and I had to return it. Um, I never thought of copying it, to be honest, because I wasn't expecting I mean, who was going to expect this to, to happen, you see? Um, but uh, I, I, implant, I, I intend to find out exactly what's what tomorrow because. Uh, it's ludicrous. I mean, I, I had to get out of that school before. Uh, they did something similar. Well, it wasn't similar, but it was. They did something as daft. Do you remember the time when uh, Gaddafi was executed? Yeah. And there was a full page image on the front of, I think it was the Daily Mirror at the time, of Gaddafi, uh, his bloodied corpse. Yeah. And that yeah. was that was the day that same school chose to give every child in the school a free newspaper with that on the front page. Oh, God's sake. Is this um, an uh, Educate Together school, is it, by any chance? I'm not sure, actually. I don't think so. No, no, it's oh, not. Okay. No, it's a national school. It's but, curious, uh, my own but, um, you know, I mean, think, I mean, I had to go down to the principal and say, what the hell is this? Of all the days, and nobody looks at that. And he said, oh, it was just a... I said, look, are you telling me, seriously telling me, not one school teacher in this school looked at that headline and looked at the full page, and it took up the full page. Do you remember the headline that time? There was almost no headline. It was just a big image of Gaddafi's bloodied uh, cadaver. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't have uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, quote under there where she said, we came, we saw, he died. Ha, 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 ha. But, I mean, we're, we're talking now, this was, this was uh, my, ch- my child at the time would have been 10. That's just so wrong. It's, um, it's I'm just busy. thinking. I'm just thinking, Vince. The body image class. That I bet that's something to do with rape, about the rape culture, and that woman if they dress certain. I, I'm just speculating here, but maybe it's about. Well, uh, I, I'm not. A, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I will. They were, for example, they were asking them a lot about weight, a lot about their appearance, and a lot about. Um, uh, I mean, my child. I tell you what, my child is here. I don't, I don't mind pulling him in for this. Just give me two seconds. Hang on. Sure. Prentice, do you have anything, yeah, like that over, anything like that over in uh, the USA? Say well, what? So do you have anything like that? Uh, how, how, how old is your um, stepchild? Stuff like that happening here in the US, but, you know, it's a little bit more uh, conservative here. Mm. So, um, you know, parents tend to get up in arms about stuff like that. Um, they try to have a porn star. Uh, Sasha Gray, um, reading the kids' uh, stories in the classroom, and right, sorry, guys. I have my 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 young fella here with me now. Just, just can you just tell the guys? Wasn't it? Well, the questions that they were asking all the children in school that was getting them upset. They were about body image, was it? Yeah. 
And what else? Personal mm. questions. And, and, ha- and how many of the girls were upset? I can't really remember. Roughly. I mean, was it how many of the class, you say? Around. Well, you were saying a half or something, wasn't it? It wasn't a half. Okay. I don't really remember. You did tell me half aired your own, though. Yeah, I... Well, I also reacted a bit. Yeah, reacted, Figure yeah. speech for me. Okay. I think he's getting shy. But, um... Yeah. Thanks, Dick. How would you go, good boy? So... Was this a mixed class, Vincent? Was it is. Boys it, it is a mixed class, yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting. You can tell us next week uh, uh, what. what uh, well, this is, I, I can't let this go because I mean, you know, this, for a start, I'd love to know what's this supposed to have to do with education. You, you know, I mean, I, I'm finding there are so many things being brought into schools, which I'm thinking, well, you know, for even, and I'll be honest, even something as simple as an eye test or an ear test, I'm thinking, I look after my children's health, I, I monitor their eyes and their ears. I don't, you know, I don't need to be asked to do that for my school. Or from the child's school, uh, you know, I, I send them to school to have an education, and regardless health, I look after that, and I do. I was talking to um, a, a lovely um, ex guard last week, and I called um, um, Jackson. Well, I think it's reinforcing this idea that somehow the parents don't look after their children. Yes. And and that's yeah. just not how it is, you know. <laughs> and you need a big mother there to tell yeah. you, you know. Yeah. What it's to ins- do, it's quite frankly, it's insulting, quite frankly. Big sis, yeah. she's there to help. Yeah, I find it insulting. But uh, yeah, that that uh, story you brought up about Gaddafi, first thing that popped in my head was Hillary Clinton, and I said, "Man," I said, "Uh, uh," and I remember that that uh paper cover that you you mentioned there it was uh magaz- it was on the magazines here and uh i mean that's a clear example of the once again the disregard they have for um men and boys in western culture because even if that was a female dictator they would not be displaying her body like that uh, like it's some you know some halloween mask or something like that you know what i'm saying well, they displayed it like a, a dead animal would be displayed as dead a successful animal, like kill on a hunt or something like that. It was perverse. It was definitely perverse. It was a trophy. It was presented like a trophy. Exactly, a, a trophy. trophy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they had given all of my, uh, if all the children in the school that day had been given uh, a, a, even a mildly pornographic image, uh, there would have been uproar. That's amazing. I think um, one of the problems is that uh, I'm sure with the newspaper thing, the, the newspaper thing is just crazy. Um, where he gave a ch- he gave children um, something like what a headline. I mean, they could they could have taken the actual front page off or something like that, or, or something. Rather in the case of um, giving a, a um, newspaper with. Um, Colonel Gaddafi. I mean, I remember he he, he himself did some pretty awful things, but I think uh, the U.S. presidents have done some pretty awful things too. And I'm sure a lot of people have will remember um, Tony Blair didn't do an awful lot of good things either. Um, but no one's got his body and put it on the front page and giving it out to kids. <laughs> well, they. Uh, I mean, I think they raped his body or something like that, didn't they? Like inserted some in his. Rectum or something like that. Me. Uh, before he before he died or after he died, one of the two. And uh, you know, some of the news agencies were linking to that, and you know, all kind of stuff. I was like, wow. It's that. It was. It was. I thought it was embarrassing. Shameful to learn this, to be honest. Um, moving back to fathers' education. Um, I am not somebody who has a third degree education. My, um, we could not afford it in the house. Um, Forty, do you have a third degree education? No. Did you have, huh? no, 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 I don't. No. I don't. Well, I don't. My sister has. Uh, my sister was pretty much the first person in our family to do a third level education. Uh, Good. Yeah. Good for it, her. Uh, Having said that, I have dyslexia, and me in school didn't 
get along brilliantly. I've got some, uh, I've got some CSEs that don't even do that anymore. The amalgamated, we used to have O levels and CSEs. And I've got some CSEs, we've got English, we've got maths, we've got history, we've got a couple of other bits and pieces. Uh, so I did okay. Actually, for the, for the area I live in, for a boy, I did, I did okay. Uh, but the idea of going to a third level education, that was never on the cards for me. Uh, it was get the age 16 and get out and get a job. Uh, and that's the only way it was ever going to be. The, this still prevails, uh, in working class Protestant areas. Boys do not carry on with education. In fact, they're lucky if they finish it. And what the education system currently classes as success is getting a kid from the start of school to the end of school without a police record. And um, yeah, if they can do that, they reckon they've done their job. Uh, Girls are more pushed to go on and to do A levels and then go on universally. Uh, it there there's something quite wrong about how we deal with boys and until we educate, we need we need to educate communities and we need to educate fathers because without the fathers being educated, we're at least having a good idea of a feeling that they need, their sons need to be educated, then we're not going to move forward. And without the education, I, I work on a factory uh, and I'm nailed to the factory floor. I cannot move up, even if I did qualifications now, because I don't have a apprenticeship, because you need better grades than I, than I had to get them get an apprenticeship, you you go nowhere and you're stuck in that factory floor till the day you die. We, we need to begin to educate our kids. Well, I think you had it right when you said um, that young men are not allowed to sit in the parents' home and spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars on an education while not working. Uh, the way girls are encouraged to do. Um, as a boy, the second you hit 18, you're pressured to get out there and, and make a living, you know. Uh, otherwise, I mean, that's, that's what your entire value as a human being is based upon whether or not you're making a living. Yeah. What? So, I mean, that's your entire identity, you know. Um, so for girls, girls had a luxury to sit, you know, in the class and, uh, they can, you know, go to school for six, eight years and, you know, spend their parents' money. But that boy, he's getting told at 18, Hey, you need to get out and find a job and contribute to this household, you know, and sign up, sign up for selective service. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, was, otherwise, he doesn't have any rights. I was, yeah. I was talking to, um, I, I had a, a friend of mine over um, from America and he brought his two sons with him. One of the sons is 14 years of age, the other son was 18 years of age. Uh, at 18 he was, he had to sign up for a selective service, otherwise he could not get a driver's license, could not go to university, could not do a whole list of things um, unless he signed up for it. Um, so. He said he knows so many. He knows loads of girls. They don't have to do it. I mean, they can still get a driver's license. They can still go to university. They can still do all sorts of weird, wonderful things. But he has to sign up. And yeah, and, I, and girls do not have to go through that, like you say. No. And that presents a moral dilemma for a boy at eighteen. From that moment forward, you know, uh, up close and personal, that you are invested. Uh, in the military, and uh, you know when if SHIT hits the fan, then you're going to be just a number in the uh, selective service raffle, you know. And you grow up watching the movies and stuff like that. And as a war vet, let me tell you, I mean, you better be glad they don't call those numbers up. 
because in you know the Vietnam War, actually seven thousand draftees ended up getting killed. So but that this, was that was the last time they used the draft in America. It was the Vietnam War? Yes, I mean, uh, when you, Vietnam you're on sector yeah. service. It's not necessarily mean you're going to be drafted. But it no. could mean you're drafted. Exactly. And I mean, they got pretty. It seemed like they got pretty close in the uh, Iraq War because they were really hurting for recruits. So they were actually discussing uh, having another draft. But uh, you know, but see, we live in in an age of asymmetrical warfare. You know, with America, they can go to war with just about any country except for Russia or or China, which are nuclear powers. But they can go to war with any other country, and they're guaranteed to win the war. You know, without uh, without investing so many, you know, so many soldiers. You know, yeah. I mean, it's dawning on people now that you know, if there's a war tomorrow between America and Russia, I mean, it'll be over before the uh, the letters, the uh, the, uh, the the draft letters arrive in, in the people's uh, in people's uh, doormats. You know, mm-hmm. because there'll be a nuclear exchange and it'll be over within the first day. Mm-hmm. And so people yeah. are. People are realizing that there's not there's there's not going to be, uh, you know, a World War Three like there was a World War Two, you know, and and so you know the whole selective service thing is is just so ridiculous, uh, and uh, I, I think you know there might be an art, you could use the selective service for the for the police in America. I think if they if they, you could, I think there's a good I would be a good idea to apply it to both men and women, uh, so that you know. We have half the cops are women, half the cops are men. I think that would be uh, an interesting social experiment. <laughs> yeah, or maybe the, uh, the fire service, you know, the fire department too. But I'm, I think that's a good idea. But uh, so, you know, the boy, he faces this more dilemma, you know, where he has, you know, he, he knows what war is, but, you know, he has to sign up for this uh, military it was pretty much decided for the military at 18. And so you're like, man, I'm invested in this military industrial complex. And that's what was going uh, through my mind at 18, you know, and girls do not have to deal with this moral dilemma. This is a growing up experience that is really thrust upon boys at 18, you know, and, uh, we do not have the luxury of like, uh, like 42 was saying, you know, going to school and, uh, just sitting there and, you know, for years and years and, uh, spending daddy's money, you know, we don't have that luxury in, in uh, most families. So. There's certain problems that you have in America that, you know, men's rights problems that we don't have in Ireland, uh, to the same extent. For example, male genital mutilation is something that's pretty rare in Ireland. But it's very common in the United States. Now. Yeah, yeah we have a we, we have a long and twisted history um, with uh, male genital mutilation uh, here in the United States. Um, I actually traced the history on that too, and it's very ugly. And I tell you, it was a very emotional experience for me. Um, reading through the, the actual books from the uh, American Medical Association uh, and things like that, where they were uh, basically uh, mutilating boys to prevent them from masturbating, you know. Oh Victoria. And this was their stated reason. Uh, we're going to perform these male circumcisions in order to, because, you know, the, the mother or father is usually the mother, you know, and not blaming the mother, but, you know, these were uh, relatively ignorant parents. So they find their boy, you know, masturbating at whatever age, you know, and so they bring the boy uh, into the doctor's office. And usually the boy's pretty young. And uh, the doctor says, well, he's performing self-abuse. That's what they called it back then, self-abuse. And uh, they actually uh, – ref- they actually – classified it as sort of a mental illness and uh, so they actually thought that masturbating would actually uh, would actually cause diseases in the body uh, because see when when the boy ejaculated when a man ejaculated 
they actually thought that was uh, was um, gonorrhea or chlamydia. You know, the secretion from uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia. So they thought that masturbating was causing this sexually transmitted disease. So as a result, they wanted to do whatever they thought necessary to prevent this boy from uh, causing himself to have this disease. <laughs> Prentice, can you go along and um, get, get a link to that and uh, put it in the um, comment bar um, and we'll try and put that onto the... Um, oh, sure. The, yeah. Um, uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I've, never heard, I've never heard anything so ridiculous in my entire life. I think, well, and this is, I mean, this is how archaic and and stuck in the dark ages we are in America. I mean, this is relatively recent, right here. You're talking uh, this stuff stopped maybe uh, 1910 or something like that. Mm, and gosh. so they kept shifting the excuse for why they needed male circumcision, why they needed to routinely perform this male genital mutilation and uh so it gets shifted now to the excuse today is that uh it prevents aids you know or you might pass on cervical cancer to the woman or there you go or you might pass on cervical cancer to the woman so here's your opportunity to prove that you're a real man yeah, <laughs> and uh, in uh, in in, in, sorry, in America, and in believe America, it or not, we, go ahead. Yeah, in Ireland, it, it actually there there is male genital mutilation. It does go on. Uh, sort of Muslim minorities and Jewish minorities here practice it. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it was this year or was it last year? We uh, uh, the Erectus our Parliament uh, banned female genital mutilation, but uh, male genital mutilation is is still not criminalized so in theory it could it could, it could take place uh and uh so um you know there's a i was just reading there wow. interesting a surgeon a, a, a plastic surgeon in dublin who's campaigning against it uh and so sorry, yeah, I, I, yeah there, on, there was sorry there was about three three years ago but there was a uh, young nigerian boy who um he, he um was circumcised and he bled to death and he died. It was uh, right. three or four years ago. That was, uh, I can't remember exactly where it was. I think it was maybe Waterford. Yes, but, uh, that's right. Yeah. One of the funny things about um, about, about uh, foreskins is that that's made into face cream. Right. Um, I can't. I, yeah, I, it's, oh, made yeah in, that, it's made into face cream and also um, for women. I, <laughs> for yeah. women, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Isn't that amazing? And you had people like Oprah promoting uh, the face cream on their show uh, before, you know, before that show went off the air. And uh, so this is something that the uh, female elite, they, is, you know, this is how decadent uh, the female elite is uh, in this country, you know, to where they're slathering uh, this product of uh, male genital mutilation over their bodies and, you know, I guess laughing in the mirror about it, you know, and uh, it's just routine, you know, it's uh, just run of the meal. But, you know, slowly but surely, people in the United States are kind of waking up and you're seeing an uh, increase in growth in the antactivist community. Um, and people I are... Have, there, there is a bunch of women on... Um... Um, Facebook called uh, If I Was a Boy. They have a hashtag there as well. I um, Sorry, I've got a bit of hair in my mouth there. <laughs> uh, I have um, a bunch of um, women on my, on my list who um, are in, in tactivists. Okay. Yeah, they, what they do is they um, basically they have de- uh, determined that their sons will never be circumcised. And they're also determined that... Um, under no circumstances will anyone ever go along and tell them it's good for them. Because I mean, it's a beautiful baby boy. Why would you go along? Why would you want to cut her up? Here's I mean, the, seriously, you know, it's it's it, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me personally. I mean, um, when um, my son was born, I mean, um, why would I want to start cutting him? Madness. Here's the voice. Yeah. Go you, ahead, forty-two. Go ahead. You've never, you've never heard a woman complaining. 
about someone's penis being too big. You always hear them complaining about it being too small, and yet they want to cut a bit off it. That makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, here in the United I, I, States... One, one, one thing about circumcision, um, I was talking to one particular lady, who a very, a very funny lady, she... Um, was replying to somebody on um, on their particular wall. Um, this person was saying they they fully support um, what you would call it, um, circumcision for boys. And it was a woman who was saying she supports circumcision for boys. So this other woman came on and said, "Oh, I I support it too. I I had my uh, my bits trimmed. Did you have yours done as well? Since you since you do support your uh, circumcision, um, no, she was." Talking about her um, bits being trimmed. Anyway, that was uh, a <laughs> wow. Paul, you know. you were, John, you were talking before about the Waterford case. Uh, as yes. I understand it, the the man was charged, but then the judge let him off on I think it was manslaughter, right, or something. It was he, he got he didn't get he didn't get imprisonment. Basically, he they were they were they bungled the the, the male circumcision operation, and the boy bled to death in Waterford. And uh, it, basically, the judge, if I recall correctly, uh, he let he let him off the guy who did the operation because he came from a different culture. Uh, I think it was the Muslim culture in uh, the, in North Africa, uh, and so he was he, he was he, he was not given any prison time. And uh, you know, again, I mean, like last last year or a couple of years ago, female circumcision has was banned in Ireland, and rightly so. Uh, but we should we should also ban male circumcision, you know. Uh, although it is very rare in Ireland, but we should still, you know, we should we should uh, human rights. Uh, it means for both genders, you know, not just for one gender. That's one of the things I keep on coming uh, telling people, like um, that abuse is abuse. We're humans too, you know. Um, there's no reason why we shouldn't have um, equal rights to what everybody else has. In seriousness. Um, well, I mean, uh, that's one area, circumcision is one area where I have to admit that uh, women do tend to get a little bit more uh, upset about and they are a little bit more informed about. Um, with men, there tends to be this sort of macho response, where, especially here in the United States, where they're like, oh, I love circumcision. If I could... You know, you're a bunch of uh, pussies. If you don't like circumcision, you know, um, you're not real men. I want my boy to look just like me. Oh, if I could get two circumcisions, I would get it. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's just, our... it, yeah. Huh? The science, the science shows though, it does, it, it does psychological damage to, to the to the baby because as a result of a circumcision. The uh, the uh, the stress hormone of cortisol is elevated in the brain of a baby boy for six months afterwards. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's a real it's it's sex it's it's sex abuse. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's 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 a horrific experience for an infant to go through, and well, it has it's, consequences. It's, that's a good point you made. Sex abuse, and um, and that's like sex, I say, it's a sexual assault. Yeah. It's a sexual assault. And that, you know, women are more willing to call it sexual assault, uh, here in the United States than the men are for some reason. And like you say, it, you, it could very well be because there's some sort of, uh, psychological damage that's, uh, been caused due to the trauma. But, um, so anyway, I posted in that chat box there. I posted it there from 1890. It's showing you there, and this is uh, the American Medical Association. It's, it's showing you there that they uh, performed circumcisions to prevent masturbation. Um, now, they also performed circumcisions here in the United States to prevent headaches, epilepsy, um, hyperactivity, um, stomach aches. Uh, and I have those articles too. And people don't understand that circumcision in this country had its genesis in, uh, circumcisions on boys and girls, not just boys. They would routinely perform circumcisions on girls too. 
uh, in order to prevent things like headaches, uh, stomach aches, fainting spells, and things like that, quote unquote, to prevent. I think one of the problems there is that people are playing God uh, with children, and that's very, very wrong. They're playing God. And see, all of this history has been conveniently forgotten. None of these people have ever been held accountable. None of these medical associations have ever been held accountable, even though they were circumcised and not just boys, but girls, too. Prentice, so, Prentice, see the circumcision, the, the forced circumcision for masturbation? Has that any connection whatsoever to the period in America where they were sterilizing young men for juvenile delinquency, LSC, and excessive masturbation? Well, um, would you say the eugen- eugenics movement, uh, you say? Yeah. I, they, were, they were sterilizing uh, young boys so that they couldn't breed to produce another child like them that was going to be a delinquent or excessively masturbate. Well, I, see... Um, I think that was in the from the 20s to the 50s. Well, see, they knew that circumcising the penis reduced penis sensitivity. Yeah. And they knew this. And uh, this was pretty much from the beginning of the creation of the uh, what's today the American Medical Association. And so you can see in their journals, they're actually saying, we know this reduces penis sensitivity, but what we're doing is we're creating real men because a real man can't control his his sexual urges. So basically they they had a sort of a express purpose of trying to reduce the penis sensitivity in men. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that was see, what yeah. constituted a real man, you see. I mean, feminists today, today I mean they they condemn female genital mutilation precisely because uh, it, it interferes with the woman's sexual pleasure. But you never see the feminists who are supposed to be for gender equality. You never hear them, uh, you know, condemn male uh, circumcision or male genital mutilation uh, for, for that reason, you know. Uh, and as you say, Prentice, it was for this, it was originally for the same reason as male, female genital mutilation was performed in order to reduce the sexual pleasure for for both the man and the woman, you know. I mean, like, it's it's uh, the double standards of feminists, uh, the, you know, that they, they abide by, you know. It's just, just it's, one gender. The double standard is insane here, here in the Western world. Because, see, we actually have um, rabbis, I'm, you know, trying not to make this an anti-Jewish or anti, you know, not bashing Jewish people, but you have a sect of uh, ultra fundamentalist Jews, uh, where they actually, you know, they have an audience in front of them, and they, you know, strap the baby boy down and they, you know, mutilate his penis, slice off the foreskin, and then the rabbi sucks the blood out of his penis with his mouth. All there in front of the audience, they're clapping, and and this is legal. It's totally legal. And then you turn on the TV, and it's just uh, the only thing they're talking about is we have to end sexual assault against girls because, you know, there might be some guy in, you know, this state over here that might be sexually assaulting a girl. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's up the, and, uh, double standard. And people have actually tried to, you know, stop this practice. All right, guys, uh, sorry, um, we are out of time at the moment here. Next week's show is about um, male suicide and the connection to uh, domestic abuse. Um, Vin, thank you very much. No problem. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. It's good to start to guys. Yeah.